Upika, we can start now. It's three o'clock. Yes, sir. We can start. Okay. Yeah. Good morning and good afternoon to uh, all of you. Uh, welcome to Air Quality Management uh, Lecture Series. Uh, today we have with us uh, Professor uh, Chandrasekhar from us. So he's going to deliver May month lecture. As you are aware that this uh, lecture being organized by Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, uh, and uh, SIPA Network, and Indian International Conference on Air Quality Management. I would like to thank all the collaborators who are helping us supporting this air quality management lecture series. Go to the next slide. Just to give uh, some background about this uh, lecture, we started this lecture in the month of October 2020. So this is about eight, eight months old. Uh, you know, uh, 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 event. Uh, this uh, lecture is first of its kind. Uh, although India faces uh, several air quality management issues, when we thought uh, we should bring out an expert across the globe and discuss about the various issues, uh, and it should provide kind of an, a platform to for the young engineers, scientists, and educators, practitioners to learn some advancement that is happening in terms of theory, technology, and applications. In the, air, air, in the area of air quality management. So as I mentioned to you, this uh, lecture series is jointly organized by Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, uh, SIPA Network, and Indian International Conference on Air Quality Management, and several collaborators who are helping us in supporting this lecture series. Go to the next. So we have an eminent speakers in the past uh, who gave uh, you know, kind, uh, enough to support uh, this uh, lecture events. And uh, all the lecture uh, uh, given by various eminent speakers were highly appreciated. And uh, uh, we are very thankful to all of them. And now uh, Professor Chandrasekhar is going, adding to the uh, another uh, uh, you know, eminent speaker to this list. Next, next slide, please. Now I'll request uh, Gopika uh, to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Chandrasekhar. Uh, Gopika is a research scholar in the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Madras. Uh, I, uh, yeah, over to Gopika. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's air quality management lecture, Professor Chandrasekhar. Uh, Professor Chandrasekhar is a tenured professor and co-director, Center for Integrated Building Energy and sustainability in the tropics at the Department of Building, National University of Singapore. His research interests include thermal comfort, ventilation, IAQ, energy efficient HVAC systems and building energy analysis with more than 275 publications in these fields in international journals and conferences. He is a co-investigate, co-inventor and holds three US and other patents. He has been an actually distinguished, distinguished lecturer since 2006 and is regularly invited as a speaker around the world. He's currently a director at large on the ASHRAE board of directors. He is active in the standards and technical committees in ASHRAE and is also actively involved in the local standardization activities in Singapore. The lecture for today is titled Indoor Air Quality Audit in Buildings, System Zone Concept, where he'll be discussing the importance of HVAC system performance and contaminant concentration levels association, which can be accomplished by adopting a system zone concept. Sir, we welcome you. Yeah, thank you, Gopika. So, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, over to you, and I welcome yeah. all the uh, uh, people to this uh, uh, lecture. Over to you, Professor Chandrasekhar. Thank you so much. Uh, I am uh, sharing my screen now. So, are you able to see my first slide? Yes, Chandrasekhar. Yeah, we are able to see. You. And uh, the audio is uh, okay? Good? Yes, good. All right, wonderful. So let us let us just get uh, started. Um, I'm just trying to work something on my screen, so positioning all the mobile uh, <laughs> screen, mobile sort of you know uh, part of the photos and videos in one place. So thank you so much for inviting me to uh, give a lecture this uh, afternoon uh, in this air quality management uh, lecture series. It is indeed my great pleasure to to do so. Um, and uh, before I even get uh, started, I, I, I do want to uh, uh, express my, 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 my uh, thoughts about the situation, the COVID-19 situation in India and uh, the tremendous impact it has had uh, in terms of uh, 
uh, people's lives. There's a lot of people being affected with the cases rising for the last several weeks now and a uh, heavy toll on people's lives as well. Um, the number of people succumbing to the disease has uh, increased in the last few days and uh, uh, my heart goes out to all our fellow uh, uh, you know, persons in different walks of life in India. And I sincerely hope and, um, uh, you know, and, and look forward to uh, things turning around quickly so that this, this whole thing can, can be brought under control. So the reason I also talk very, very briefly at the beginning about that is um, uh, I, I'm also involved in some of the discussions related to the airborne uh, transmission of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the sort of things that one could and should uh, consider in the built environment. That is not the subject of my presentation today, but just to give you some background as to uh, where I am currently in the last year and a half in terms of my own uh, research work and interest. Today, I wanted to talk about um, something that uh, my colleagues and I, we have been following as our guiding principle in uh, buildings, in, in all the work that we've been doing here in Singapore for the last almost uh, 25 years or so. And that is really talking about what should one do if we were to evaluate the quality of indoor air in buildings? Um, you can roughly look at it in the context of an indoor air quality audit. Um, the word audit here means you go in to assess the quality of the environment in, in, in a building and then see what we can uh, draw in terms of inferences from uh, such an effort and see how we can put certain mitigation measures or certain uh, management measures in place for continued operation towards a better performance. So what I'm saying here would, would uh, sort of emerge clearly even as I uh, keep going through my slides. Um, but the main point really is about how do you go and evaluate the indoor air quality in buildings? And the hyphenated phrase system zone concept is something that we have found extremely valuable in our effort. And uh, we, we continue to advocate this concept of system zone interaction. And I will elaborate that as we go to the talk. Um, okay. So uh, I think there are some learning objectives uh, that I have stated here, which I don't really want to go through uh, one by one. Uh, it's really summarizing the way I introduced the topic for the day. And, and by the way, I would uh, post lecture, I will uh, uh, try and uh, present some of these things that I've been talking about through some sort of a PDF uh, format so that it could be shared amongst the participants. I'll pass that to the organizers. Um, okay, all right. So indoor air quality. And I think if we look at this word indoor air quality, we can relate to that in so many ways. Uh, when we are in a building, we could see things that uh, are visible. There could be a lot of particles in the air. And then we say, okay, quality of air is not so good. We could smell certain things. We could smell uh, chemicals. We could smell uh, maybe even say cooking activities. We could smell um, mold perhaps. So there are so many ways in which we can relate to this term called indoor air quality. Now, from a even more generic consideration, we want the air quality, whether it's outdoor or indoor, to be of a level that uh, we find it acceptable. If we find it of uh, our to our liking, we find it uh, you know it is a pleasure sensation rather than uh, and um, a kind of a discomfort or unacceptable sort of a, a perception. So when it comes to indoor air quality, there are kind of some basic principles or fundamentals in which we proceed to look at uh, what can be done. We say something like a source control approach. Very simple. If we know where, what the source is, remove the source. I mean, even if we take the context of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, if we know, we know there's a pathogen, we know there is a virus, can we remove it? So if a contaminant can be removed, that's the ideal thing to do. And if we also focus on 
removal versus what else can be done. So source control means if we can remove it, remove it. Certain things we cannot remove. For instance, when you talk about buildings, people are going to be inside the buildings. Now, carbon dioxide is a contaminant that is generated by people. Can we remove the people? Not a viable proposition. The whole function of a building is for people to be in there and do certain activities. Um, there could be certain activities, even in a typical office setting, which may generate a level of contaminants that you possibly can't remove entirely. Uh, maybe there are certain activities like uh, printing, for instance. It may generate some fine particles, right? There could be certain other materials used in the buildings that are going to lead to some outgassing and certain chemicals being released. Perhaps we can be a little bit more, um, you know, considerate towards what kind of materials we choose. But at the end of the day, there would still be certain level of emissions that we may not have a choice of removing entirely. Then you won't have the material in the first place. So the key point is, if you can remove it, remove it. If not, then we resort to what is called an exposure control approach. Exposure control is talking about using the ventilation uh, measure, the outdoor air, and then we use that to dilute the contaminants indoor. Here in three important uh, aspects become critical. The quality of the air that we use, which is related to the outdoor air in this instance. So we've got to ensure that it's a reasonable level, reasonably good quality. There are several parts of the world where this may indeed be a challenge in itself, but nevertheless, the quality needs to be uh, uh, adhered to at least as a minimum quality. So if the quality is bad, you got to do something about it. You got to clean it. You got to filter it. That goes without saying. Quantity, how much? Because in a lot of uh, places, a lot of buildings, the quantity makes a direct impact on the energy consumption and thereby to the sustainability question that we, we are also equally interested in space context becomes uh, uh, a bit of a challenge. You can take a lot of outside air, clean it and move it into the building to dilute, but at a very high energy penalty. Now we may not want to do that. So we had to think about what is the minimum quantity of outdoor air that is important. So quality, quantity. Then I put in, in the third box, green box, something called room air distribution. Another important parameter, another very critical parameter in my personal view, it's not just the quantity of good quality air that you draw into your air conditioning system or even through natural ventilation. It's how that air moves through the parts of the room that are significant and important, i.e. where the person is seated. If I am going to require an air quality around me to be of good level, I need to have that air being properly brought to my area what is called the breathing zone, and then I can experience the good quality air that is being presented to me in the building. Quality, quantity, room air distribution, which is really ventilation effectiveness, that's the term, the technical term that we refer to. All of these are important in terms of dilution of the indoor contaminants. Source control, exposure control, if we can manage this in the sequence and in the hierarchy that I just presented, we would have ensured a reasonable level of indoor air quality in, in any type of setting. Um, let me now go to this whole idea of indoor air quality audit and management. What's the purpose of it? The purpose is we want to establish what is the indoor air quality signature of the building. In other words, we want to know as is, as the building is being occupied and used for whatever function it is designed for, what is my current indoor air quality level? Am I good in terms of the chemical emissions, in terms of the biological emissions, such as uh, bacterial count or mold and you know, those sort of aspects, particles, you know, are there too much uh, uh, particulate matter present in the, in the indoor air? Uh, are they in, in, in terms of the size uh, differentiation, do, are there more of the small particle size air? All of these are important questions that we want to know. We want to be able to understand status quo uh, of the indoor air quality. And then we look at ways and means to improve the indoor air quality. 
We might determine that in ventilation is inadequate. We may determine that there are certain materials that need not be there in the functional space. We may even determine that the layout of the space could be modified or improved. All of this with the intention of improving the indoor air quality. Where? In the breathing zone. And I, 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 I will reiterate this and keep coming back to this point about in the breathing zone, that's the way, that's the place you want to improve the indoor air quality. And uh, some of the technologies and strategies that we'll be discussing in a, in, a, in a short while, you would see that it's got a direct reference to why that becomes important. It's the people around whom we want to improve their quality. Let's see if we can do that by the micro environmental indoor air quality, the place where it matters the most. And then we could develop this into an indoor air quality management plan that would then be the uh, a kind of uh, blueprint for how this enhanced indoor air quality can be sustained over a period of time. And it becomes like a, a routine facilities management uh, you know, paradigm, if you like, or an action plan, which could be sustained and maintained and monitored. And then there could be a feedback control loop if you want to even automate it in that sense. There are so many different ways these strategies can be incorporated into the building. So what's the indoor air quality audit? There is a framework that I present here. And um, just looking at this framework, uh, I, I can spend an hour just talking about this. I, I wanna try and keep this to uh, a minimum overview approach. And then we look at some of the other specifics of what is involved here. So the framework here is when we wanna do an audit, we wanna be able to understand what is that physical space we're talking about. So this generic stage is really looking at uh, kind of doing a simple walkthrough in the space. So I want to probably go and take a walkthrough of the space where um, the indoor air quality is need, you know, it needs to be uh, determined. And it's just understanding going through the space and looking at the uh, layout, looking at the way people are seated, the occupant density, looking at some of the, um, if it's an office building, some of the activities that happen there uh, to get a sense of, are there any places within that layout that needs uh, special consideration? Uh, do we spot something of uh, an, uh, you know, a, a challenge in terms of how the air is being distributed? Are there stagnant zones? Uh, is there a very high occupant density in certain part of that space relative to another? All these issues, investigating all these issues become very critical. Uh, so the first one, the generic stage is the walkthrough, investigating the issues that I just mentioned, and then becomes to, then, then we draw a plan of um, some kind of, you know, conceptual characterization of the environment. We say, oh, this place needs the consideration because there's high occupancy. I want to be able to understand what's happening in the, in the individual environment a little bit more in detail. There is a meeting room that probably doesn't get used that often. And when it gets used, maybe there is an excessive, uh, you know, draft sensation in that room. So, you know, you, you, you would then want to think about why is that happening? Why is that part of the room, the meeting room, having a slightly different uh, airflow perception or airflow uh, distribution? It's all got to do with the way the air is distributed. Now, if, if you see what I'm talking about, it's getting a connection between the physical space and how the environmental control in that space is happening. And herein we relate to air moves from some place to some other place. And that is part of the air conditioning and air distribution system within that particular building or a floor or a house or whatever is that, you know, our so-called boundary conditions. Now you might uh, begin to see the reason why I mentioned this system zone in the initial instance, because the indoor air quality in any particular volume of space in a building, it's a function of how well the air flows, how well the air is distributed, how much ventilation we have taken in the quality of outdoor air, the quantity of outdoor air and how it's distributed. Um, now, system zone, why is that important? Simply because you need a mechanical system that's going to move the air, the ventilation air, and whatever other types of air you need for cooling and heating or whatever into that space. You need to have a relationship between the mechanical system, the air conditioning system, put very simply, we call it the HVAC system, 
which is typically an air handling unit in a building that's got ductwork that moves the air. I'm sure the audience here is quite familiar with the terms and what I'm talking about. That is part of characterizing the environment. I need to be able to understand how is the system related to the physical space, the volume of space, the occupied zone, then forms the whole methodology of collecting the data. What kind of data? We want to be able to collect a lot of uh, important uh, environmental parameters like temperature, humidity, particulate matter, the small size particles like PM 2.5 and lower uh, size particles. Um, chemical measurements, are there you know, specific chemical uh, um, compounds that we want to measure here? The volatile organic compounds, the outgassing that may happen from certain materials, formaldehyde, ozone, all these are important, uh, fairly significant indoor contaminants that we'll want to take note of. Can we measure that? Can we identify where to measure? Ventilation characteristics is another important aspect of uh, this, this data collection part, simply because of the system zone. There has to be a system which moves the air, which results in a certain contaminant concentration levels in the space. Hence, measuring just the contaminant concentration will not give us adequate information or insight into how the system is performing. That's where the ventilation measurements are needed. I will discuss with you shortly how we do that, but that's what the ventilation measurements mean, means, which really is about how much ventilation is being brought in, the quantity. The quality we can understand from the way the air handling unit, the filter filters that are used, we will get a sense of what's happening there, but how much the quantity, how it's distributed, we can, through certain methodology, measure the distribution characteristics, the ventilation effectiveness. That's what the data collection through objective measurements is about. Then we are talking about things such as what we call um, the uh, subjective responses. That means we do an occupant survey. We ask the people, you know, in indoor air quality, we always say there is nobody better than the person himself or herself who can say, is this room bad? Is it stale? Are we having contaminants of concern? Are we having issues that we need to be mindful of and worried about? Nothing better than asking the people. So it's important in all the studies that we do in indoor air quality audits that we talk to the people. We ask the occupants in the building and see what their perception is. Occupant survey, a very critical part of the audit that we normally do. And then talking to the facilities manager, the building manager, because a building manager knows a little bit more about what's happening in the building than perhaps the occupants for sure, because he's maintaining the systems and see how that is going to impact the occupants uh, response. And also we as uh, experts in indoor air quality, we understand the general principles but we wouldn't understand the specific building where we are trying to get an evaluation of the indoor air quality. Hence, talking to the building manager becomes an important and integral part of the IAQ or indoor air quality audit. Having done these measurements, then we look at the data, we look at analyzing what it means to us, what kind of story it tells us. We can compare with standards that are available, there are WHO indoor air quality standards, there are local standards. I'm aware in India, there is an indoor air quality standard from, uh, uh, from India. Uh, we have our own standard in Singapore, Singapore standard. Uh, there are ASHRAE standards, ISO standards, European standards. So we do have a feel for what kind of, you know, levels of contaminants of some specific uh, indoor contaminants that we could be looking at in uh, analyzing our measured data. So that's what the data analysis part uh, uh, comes in. We could do a fairly comprehensive statistical analysis with all the questionnaires that we have collected and see what do the people tell us. And ideally, if we can find some sort of a relationship between people's perception and the measured data in terms of what might be perceived to be a generally acceptable uh, level of indoor air quality, then it, it gives us a lot of insights into that particular building and what the indoor air quality is about. We could then propose mitigation recommendations. 
what can be improved? Is ventilation the issue? How can we improve that? Is a particular area not getting enough airflow? What can be done? Is some part of the floor or the building uh, experiencing very cold temperatures of the air? Why is that? What could be done to improve that kind of uh, 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 problem situation and uh, enhancing the overall comfort and indoor air quality? So here is a framework of the indoor air quality audit. We have used it, as I said, for more than 25 years. We find this extremely valuable. We even have this incorporated into a curriculum, the graduate curriculum. We have a module that deals with indoor environmental quality, and we incorporate this as part of uh, that discussion over there. So let me, let me move on. So the key takeaway here is we should look at the indoor air quality evaluation in any building using the system zone approach because the indoor air quality contaminant levels and the ventilation levels in any space is a function of what the system is doing. So we've got to be able to relate to a particular system. As an example, I can just share with you, if you have, let's say a tall building, you have air, air handling units in different floors. There is no point in measuring, say you have a 10 story building, there isn't much point in measuring the contaminant levels in level two, for instance, and then you have no knowledge about how the system there is performing, and then you try and get some general design data of an air handling unit. That's not, that's not what we're looking for. We want to know when the people are in the building, when the system is in operation, the level of indoor air quality that is created in the space, that's what we are after. System zone, we want to be able to relate the system to the zone for the indoor air quality. We established the status of IAQ by measuring the various concentration levels of the different indoor air contaminants, and then we carry out the ventilation performance. These are the three important takeaways from what uh, I discussed with you as the indoor air quality audit. Now, let me move on. I want to just share some case studies that over the years we have collected. Several years back, this is more than 20 years ago, late 90s, we did a series of buildings, and you can see here questionnaire survey. Um, it's not something that only we have done uh, such analysis. There are sick building syndrome symptoms that are fairly standard established in the, in, the, in the literature. And when you look at some of them, like dry eyes, blocked nose, dry throat, dry skin, headache, lethargy, runny nose, you know, uh, rash, and those kind of things, very commonly documented. We find that about one in three people do experience symptoms. And these symptoms are very clearly defined. What is an SBS symptom? Somebody experiences any one of the symptoms when they are in the building. Then when they leave the building, the symptoms disappear. When they come back into the building, the symptoms reappear, okay? Then it is called a symptom. So we have a very detailed questionnaire that goes through this process of identifying what an occupant expresses a symptom. If somebody has a problem or a symptom in the building, he has a problem when he goes out and he has a problem when he comes back, that is not a symptom. Because SBS, sick building syndrome symptom, disappears when you leave the building. It's very building specific or building related. Uh, then we compared, um, uh, we have some of these publications uh, in Indoor Eye Journal, for instance, this one. Um, we compared this, our findings uh, with some of the other countries' uh, findings at the time. So we were doing our own project uh, roughly in tandem with what was being done by our colleagues in Europe and several countries uh, that were involved in the study. And you can see here the percentage dissatisfied, people expressing dissatisfaction with the indoor air quality. It varies from something like say 13, 14%, all the way up to 40%. In some of the Scandinavian countries, uh, we find, we notice from the literature that a fairly high percentage of people do express dissatisfaction with sick building syndrome uh, kind of an experience. So it varies and it varies for a variety of reasons, better awareness, uh, really they can be quite sensitive to some of the threshold contaminant levels. So, you know, they, they, there's a whole bunch of reasons that can be uh, associated with it. But at the minimum, you notice that at least about 10 to 15% of people do express dissatisfaction. For a moment, if you reflect, why is this the case? We, why are we stopping at 10 to 15%? If you then look at standards, indoor air quality standards or ventilation standards, and if you find what is considered indoor air quality acceptability, you notice that typically the standards would say 
at least about 80% or 90% of people express satisfaction. There you go. We don't have a standard that says everyone should be satisfied. Although our intent, although our goal should be such, why should anyone not be given that right to have good, clean air in the building? And if you follow some of the discussion along those lines, technology wise, not impossible. We can create, we can literally create, you know, environments for every individual in the building that can provide uh, not just the minimum level, probably at, uh, more than the minimum, more like a good indoor air quality for all the occupants in the building. It will change, it will require some paradigm change. It may require some rethink about what we mean by indoor air quality in the building. It's not a general observation, but more like uh, individual personal based, individual occupant centric uh, assessment. I will now share with you some of the contaminant level, the details of an indoor air quality audit, as I had mentioned earlier, this chemical, this biological, physical, we can do snapshots like this, where we deploy certain instruments that can do continuous monitoring over a period of time. What you're actually seeing here is the CO2 level being monitored, say a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that's a half a day, and then that's the next week's Monday. Such signature monitoring data, continuous monitoring gives a lot of information. What's happening due to, you know, system coming in, system turning off, uh, when people go out for lunch, that's the, that's the kind of depression you see everywhere. People leaving for lunch, the, the CO2 level drops. And uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, typically, you know, it comes from people. When people are inside the building, you know, you're gonna have CO2. There are other chemicals, total volatile organic compounds, formaldehyde, carbon monoxide in certain countries, certain situations where you have uh, combustion as a process of heating probably, there could be CO issues. But not everywhere you're gonna have all the contaminants and, and in some part for, you know, where you don't have heating and you don't have any cooking activities, maybe CO is not an issue there. Biological activities, biological contaminants, Again, related to people and visitors and food particles that might be left over or, or you know, uh, thrown into the, uh, uh, the waste bins. And we can uh, determine the general level of hygiene in the buildings. So we can calculate what we call total bacteria count and uh, yeast and mold count. There's a process to it. I won't go into the details of it. You can use different uh, agar plates to collect the air sample, take it to a lab for incubation. For the bacteria, it can be done in about 48 hours. For yeast and mold, it requires about five days of incubation before you get to see some colonies being formed on the agar plate. And then you can determine the extent to which, you know, that translates to in terms of colony forming unit per meter cube as the unit uh, used for bacterial contamination. Then there are factors that we can look at that affect the ventilation performance. This is really talking about the ventilation performance. Um, and uh, you notice here the space layout, I mentioned this earlier, the quantity supply diffusers and return grills, all of this will impact the uh, ventilation uh, distribution and the effectiveness of how that air goes through the occupied space. So air distribution, why is that important and what does that do? What, what do we mean by airflow distribution? Uh, to give you examples, sometimes in a building you might experience, you know, in certain locations, there is a draft of air that comes onto you. You, you feel that sensation, you feel that perception. Uh, it may be a good perception, good sensation, or it may be an unpleasant sensation. If the air is too cold, it becomes drafty. If the air is um, not cold, in fact, if it is the warmer side, 25 degrees Celsius, 26 degrees Celsius, 28 degrees Celsius. Right now I'm sitting in a room in my, in my home where there is a ceiling fan up there. It's, it's been in operation since morning. I am not using an air conditioning unit and I feel the airflow around me. It, it's a pleasant sensation because the temperature is probably only about 27, maybe even 28 degrees. So airflow can be used as, as a good feel, good sensor, if you like. To have that sensation, some of these things are important. If the air doesn't come to where I am, it's getting short-circuited, it doesn't mean much to me. 
it can come directly to where I'm seated. In this case, I spoke the example of a ceiling fan that's just moving the air around. But if it is, say, a properly designed air conditioning and air distribution system, commercial buildings, office buildings, shopping malls, uh, healthcare settings, you're going to have a place where there is an air conditioning system, an air handling unit. It's going to move the air through ductwork. And then we have supply diffusers that push the air into the occupied space. If that air doesn't come to the space, there could be short circuiting. Supply to return or exhaust grill, it means short circuiting. Then there could be what you call a piston flow. That is something like a single pass or one directional flow, unidirectional flow. That is kind of the best design one could think about because I am not mixing the air everywhere in the room. But the most common method that we use is called perfect mixing. It's called mixing ventilation. It mixes the room air everywhere. So the, the, the point again here is mixing ventilation is the common strategy. In there, the quality of air everywhere in the room is the same. I want to uh, submit to you to think through as I'm presenting the next few minutes, the thought, why should I aim to have the air quality to the same everywhere in the room. A room has a certain area and volume that will be occupied by people, by occupants. And there is other parts of the room, the upper parts of the room that is never going to be experienced by the humans. I always tell my students, think about where your nose is going to be, which is the place where you're inhaling and exhaling. Inhalation is the important one. That's what is going to give you the sensation of air quality. Am I going to inhale directly from the air volume three meters above me, 2.5 meters above me, floor below, at the floor, unless I'm doing maybe some kind of exercise, unless I'm doing yoga, for instance, which I do sometimes. And then if I'm very close to the floor level, that air quality is important. Otherwise, typical normal activities in, in office buildings or, or malls or whatever, human height. We're talking about 1.2 meters height when you're seated, about 1.5, 1.6 meters height, maybe 1.7, let's say, when you are standing. Lit I'm literally creating a, a volume of air around my nose, and I would call that the breathing zone. Roughly about half a meter. Think about it as a cylinder. Think about it as, the, as a sphere, but that's what matters. My inhalation process is going to draw the air from that breathing zone. If we have this understanding and say that it's, it's necessary and probably important to ensure the quality of air in that breathing zone is, is good, and we don't have to maintain that same quality three meters up above me, then a whole new paradigm of air distribution emerges, which I'll talk about as you go along. So ventilation characteristics, how do we measure? We use tracer gas techniques. We use a tracer that doesn't interact with the air, and then we can determine its flow path by just monitoring the concentration levels. We determine something called the age of air, which is basically what is the time that a particular air molecule has spent. If it is outside air, it's freshest when it comes in supply diffuser. It is the oldest when it reaches the exhaust grill or the return grill. So we can, we can determine the time spent or the time lapse from the time the air, the air enters the space, I would again relate to the breathing zone and the time it goes back into the return grill. We can determine called, something called the air change per hour, how many times the room air has exchanged, has been exchanged with the outside air. An important parameter in determining how much outside air ventilation we are providing. Then the very important uh, parameter I've been talking about, the air exchange effectiveness, which relates to how this air is actually moving within the breathing zone in the context of the whole group. These are important parameters. They are, they are de there are details which I wouldn't have the time to go through in this presentation, but that's what we're trying to do. Uh, okay, I do have a detail here. You can, you can probably see from here, there is a supply diffuser, there is the return grill, the person is seated here. I'm talking about, can I maintain this air quality as, as comfortable, as, as uh, high level as possible? And we can determine by monitoring several of this contaminant concentration level. In our case, when we do this study, we use a tracer 
So we find what is the tracer level C as in the supply air, occupied the occupant level, then in the inhaled air, then this is any point in the room, and this is the exhaust grill. There are certain indicators, the air quality index, based on what we call the contaminant removal effectiveness. For those of you who are interested in the details, when you receive the PDF, you can look at the equation. It's basically saying, how fresh is the air quality here in the person's breathing zone? In other words, how much of the clean air supply, the ventilation air supply, reaches the inhalation zone without mixing with the rest of the room air? That's the point. That's what we're trying to talk about. So contaminant removal effectiveness is a way of understanding how that can be done. We use different types of tracer gas, sulfur extra chloride. We used to use it in the past. We don't do that much these days because SF6 is, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's got a greenhouse gas, uh, 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 greenhouse gas rating. So we try not to use it if we can avoid it. We, we do that. We, we try to do that now with uh, uh, CO2. I mean, it's also not the ideal way, but then we, you need some tracer to monitor what is happening to the airflow movement within a given volume of space. Tracer gas measurements allows us to track the airflow in the room and then determine some of the parameters that I mentioned earlier. How do we do the air change per hour? You, 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 you see how much air the tracer has entered in the room. Its movement within the room will be a function of how the air flows. And if you stop the introduction of the tracer, after a while, it's going to decay and you get a profile like this. The decay profile on a semi-logarithmic plot determines the slope of this line determines the air change per hour. So we have uh, ACH or air change per hour determined by doing this tracer gas measurement. Um, if you have a high number, it's good. The high number means that the room is being exchanged with outside air two times, three times, four times, five times. Uh, typically in, in, in uh, tropical buildings, we get about one air change per hour, which is typically what you get about uh, trying to be you know, in compliance with a lot of ventilation standards. That's the minimum ventilation requirement that one would want to have, one, 1 1.2 air change per hour. Um, very briefly on the air exchange effectiveness, which is a parameter or term used in the context of uh, ventilation air distribution. Um, Air exchange effectiveness of one is related to a perfectly mixed air, mixing ventilation. That's the reference point. If you have you know, an air exchange effectiveness of two, that means it's a displacement flow. Why is a displacement flow a good thing to happen? That means the clean air that we are creating by the quality of the outside air and the quantity of the outside air, if you can take that air and bring it directly to the person's breathing zone, that's the idea. Now that may not be so straightforward, but if you can design a strategy where the air flows in one direction, I supply at the floor or near the floor or lower height of the, of the room, and then it moves up, you will get something close to two. There's a perfect displacement flow. Anything in between, say, you know, or less than one, for instance, it's short circuiting. It is going to be short circuit because the air doesn't even get to the occupied zone. That's when we say we're going to have short circuiting. We will want to avoid short circuiting. If the building is designed as a conventional mixing ventilation system, you would measure one. We have measured hundreds of buildings and we, 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 we actually measure this, right? In in-situ real buildings, we get this data. And if you have a different air distribution, like an underflow system or you know, a displacement ventilation, you will typically get more than one, 1 1.5, 1.4, there about, I will share some data with you shortly. Okay, the data is coming right here. So we've done several ventilation studies in the past, and this is during this period of time, some 20 odd years ago. And what did we do? We did about, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine buildings. Um, two of them had floor by floor AHU served, served by a CAV, constant air volume system. But uh, six of them had floor by floor air handling units, a variable air volume system typical of most buildings uh, in today's context at least. And there was one building that had what we call a central AHU system that serves both floors above and floors below, but it was also based on VAV system. So we measured the air change per hour. Look at the spread. You know, we get 
most of them uh, around the one or slightly lower than one, which means the ventilation was indeed a little bit of an issue. But there were also some where the ventilation machine was high in the sense that uh, buildings don't always have the same level of ventilation across all building types. It, it will vary and it does vary in, in a lot of buildings. Then we have, we, we computed the air change per hour and translated that into uh, what we call the fresh air or outside air provision. If you base it on the design occupancy, remember in buildings, there is a design occupancy and an actual occupancy. Based on design occupancy, again, there is a spread that goes between say three, four liters per second, all the way up to 20 or liters per second per person. Now, this is definitely on the very high side. Our standards at that point in time was about 3.5, 3.6, which is what we get as the minimum or the lowest. So not a surprise, all buildings were designed to be that and we were getting something like that on the design basis. And if you convert this or look at it in the context, oh, okay, I thought I had the actual occupancy as well, we don't have. So actual occupancy data, sometimes we get more outside there because the design occupancy is typically based on every person gets so much, so many square meters in the building space. It doesn't happen. Sometimes it is low and you get high outside air provision. On the same consideration, sometimes if more people are packed into certain area, occupant density increases, you find that the actual provision may indeed be lower than what you know, it, 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 what it should be in terms of minimum provision. Look at this, the air exchange effectiveness, they're all hovering around the one mark. Of course, one building, it, it is quite different. And that's the one where it was almost impossible to do a very systematic tracer gas measurement, huge volumes of space involved, it becomes a challenge. But for most of the other buildings, we were typically getting about the, at the local occupant level, we were getting about uh, one. And that's what you expect to get. Air exchange effectiveness of mixing ventilation system will be around this. There's no, there's no surprise here. So our general observation was using tracer gas analysis in in situ measurements, ventilation measurements, significant variations in ACH values. So we can't just do in one floor of a 20 story building and say that's what applies in all the, all the other floors. We should at least do some representative flows to get a sense of in that particular building of that sort of a system design, the mechanical system design, the air conditioning system design, you might expect air change rates to be say in this range or the air ventilation airflow provision to be in this sort of a range. We did observe some minor short circuiting profile in some of the zones and the AE, the air exchange effectiveness values were generally indicative of mixing ventilation flow patterns. And as I said, that's what we designed for, that's what we built the systems in the building, and that's what we measure. So it's, it's kind of consistent with what was designed and what was built. I wanna share with you another specific case here where we had a slightly different type of building being, a different type of air conditioning system being used. Uh, this was part of an enterprise challenge uh, uh, grant that we had uh, in 2005. Um, a system that we had developed in our own group. It's uh, looking at uh, some fundamentally different design concept. Uh, we separate the ventilation requirement from the cooling requirement. So it was what we call a single coil twin fan system. One fan is for outside air ventilation. Another one is for cooling, the recirculated air. Uh, again, the numbers are here, it's a fairly large unit. Um, so something like, uh, you know, 300, 23, 40 kilowatts capacity, uh, which is quite a large one in terms of uh, the air handling unit. So this is the floor plan, floor layout, individual rooms, open plan spaces. Um, and this is the place where the air handling unit uh, is located. And the idea of separating the ventilation from the cooling, decoupled ventilation system is what we're talking about here. Um, look something like this. There is a fresh air uh, compartment. There's a return air compartment or recirculated air compartment in the individual spaces or the zone spaces. And then uh, we control how much ventilation is needed based on the local CO2 data. And then the balance comes from the return air. So basically what it means that I can individually control the amount of ventilation provided in the different zones in the building. 
and that's the that's the technological innovation that we had in our system that we developed uh, for 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 an application like this. We uh, on the left hand side is an image that um, does this measurement, the continuous monitoring. We use this is a multi gas. Uh, monitor that we are talking about, a photoacoustic infrared uh, principle based monitor. And we use that uh, fairly routinely in our measurements. Um, I will share the data that we collected. You can notice here CO2 levels Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday. It's off because Saturday is, is generally, you know, at some point in our, in our uh, working arrangements in, in Singapore and even the university we turned into a five day week. So the earlier data you saw a little bit of, you know, a half a day profile, whereas this time here, no Saturday work. So CO2 levels are very, very low. So this is CO2 levels. Look at the temperature, uh, I'm sorry. This is the uh, TVOC, the total volatile organic compounds on the top and the carbon monoxide levels here. The solid red line indicates what is the recommended threshold limit values based on our own local standards and guidelines. And you know, you find that when the building air conditioning system is in operation, ventilation is provided, that's the time when the levels are quite low, well within the threshold limit values. Nighttime when the system is shut, the levels build up. There you see all of them building up. They reach about slightly more than three parts per million. And that is inevitable. When you don't have any air movement, no ventilation, there will be outgassing and it will increase the levels of you know, things being built up. But notice one thing that is significant. I would like to draw your attention here. When we turn the system on, the levels drop quite quickly, very quickly in all this, on all the days. The reason is we are moving outside air ventilation directly to the occupied zone. And that's what the system is about. As I said, it's a decoupled ventilation system. So when you get outside air or ventilation air really to get to the occupied zone directly and faster, you will result, you, you will see a result which is much, much more favorable in terms of diluting the contaminants quickly in that space. And, and we observed that in that in that particular building. Um, here's the temperature and humidity profile. Typically, we get about 23 to 24 degrees. That's what the building was designed for. Temperature-wise, humidity, again, very well maintained and controlled. That was one, one example, uh, a case study that I'm, I just shared with you. Another uh, study, another actual field measurement. This is a place where you have uh, two handling units, the red and the black one, if you like. And then we were studying the red AHU, AHU2. And what you're seeing here is some of the details in terms of uh, when we talk about the one, two, three, four, and five, these are the sampling points for measurements. We have uh, a sampling point from where the air is drawn, and then we continuously monitor this over a period of time. And that's the plots that I've been sharing with you on the continuous monitoring plot. Um, so this, this is a fully ducted supply and ducted return. The red one is the ducted supply, and the pink one is the ducted returns. It's taking all the return air back to the air handling unit, and then your recirculation, and the whole cycle continues. We always have, in an indoor air quality audit measurement, something like an ambient point. I, I may not have mentioned this earlier when I talked about the framework. It is important, useful, to have this, this consideration incorporated in our general planning. Because you, you want a reference point, how good or bad the outside air is in terms of CO2 level, in terms of um, uh, VOC levels or particulate matter, you want a reference point. That's what the outside level is important. And, and here again, the ventilation measurement, you see we use uh, SF6 measurement. You look at the, you know, from the point of dosing to a level and then it decays. And I want to show the next profile, which is the straight line profile. You see on a semi-logarithmic plot, you find that it comes like a straight line. If you see the straight line profile, then you know that it has been a reasonably successful test, which is a gas test. And we compute the uh, ages of air are all presented here from the software of the instrument and the tool that we use. And then we compute the air exchange. Okay, this instrument gives a slightly different parameter. It doesn't call it effectiveness, it calls it efficiency. But when we, look at a number of 50% efficiency, 
that means it is one in terms of the air exchange effectiveness. That, that's, as you can see, written at the bottom of this slide. Um, then another case study here, this was uh, again done uh, 2009, I would imagine, 10, uh, maybe a little bit later. This is in uh, our, at that time, it was a newly retrofitted zero energy building uh, of our building and construction authority academy. Let me describe to you what this uh, different study was about. On, on, on the right-hand side, what I call the ceiling supply mixing ventilation strategy, it's a conventionally designed space, SETF, single coil twin fan air handling unit, 3-3, just to give you which specific age you're serving here, conventional system design. You know, there's an air handling unit, it moves the air to the space, and then it, it is distributed to the diffusers. One difference though, because it is single coil twin fan, the technology that we have developed, the ventilation air is moved in a separate duct to individual occupied zone before it is mixed with the recirculated air, which is also moved simultaneously and distributed. Now, the reason, as I had mentioned to you earlier, we want to do the decoupled ventilation and move it separately because we want to provide a better air quality. We want to provide and control the ventilation provision independently. So that's the ceiling supply mixing ventilation strategy here. And on the left-hand side, we got two different spaces. The one on the left-hand side here, A6, A5, and A7, is that conventional displacement ventilation strategy. On the right-hand side, we got something which is very interesting. We have an underflow air distribution strategy combined with what we call a personalized ventilation air distribution. Now, what's this personalized ventilation? Watch what the word personalized is talking about. The ventilation air, the outside air, the one that's shown as a green line, it does not even get dropped at the ceiling level as a ceiling supply diffuser. It is brought all the way down to the person's breathing. So literally I have an outlet in front of me. That's what happened in this particular uh, layout here for the A3, A2, and A1. So I've got displacement ventilation on the extreme left-hand side. In the middle here, it's underflow combined with personalized ventilation. On the right-hand side, it is conventional ceiling supply mixing ventilation. The common denominator for all these three spaces is single coil twin fan. Now, what do the results look like? And I'm presenting the ventilation data here, the air change per hour computed and the air exchange effectiveness characteristics. I wanna just do this to highlight your attention to air exchange effectiveness computed. Remember the A1, A2, and A3 is personalized ventilation and underflow air distribution. Look at the number, 1.65, 1.68, 1.7, 1.7. Remember what I said earlier? Mixing ventilation, you'll get one. When you get anything close to two or even you know, something in this range, it means it's a good thing. So personalized ventilation actually creates even better air quality than just a simple displacement ventilation or underflow. Look what's happening in terms of the, um, uh, uh, the mixing ventilations, the extreme right-hand side or uh, a schematic I showed you earlier, 1.1, 1.1, because that's the best a mixing ventilation can do. So nothing surprising, we did the measurements, we got data that basically says, theory tells you mixing gives you one, practical measurements, objective measurements confirms that, substantiates that. Theory will tell us personalized ventilation should give you better effectiveness because you're bringing the clean air directly to the person's breathing zone. Our measurements confirm that. So I just want to highlight the, the advantage of doing something like a localized ventilation provision. Here I got the slide that just compares the ventilation rate, say in the context of air change across different climatic conditions, different countries. Notice here that the uh, European countries, Nordic climate, continental Europe, and even Mediterranean Europe, you have a fairly large range of ACH that, that, that people have measured in those buildings. Tropical climate, we get about one. Remember the one air chain I was talking about, or even less than that sometimes. This is because we use a high recirculation in tropical climates. And why we get this high ACH for the European climate? 
because there are times of the year when you can open all the windows, you can use 100% outside air. That's the reason you get that huge spread. Your, 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 your fall, late fall, uh, autumn time and your spring time, you can actually open up and get a lot more outside air because it's just nice in terms of temperature and the quality of air that you don't even need to think about recirculation in those environmental conditions. Some other observations. Ventilation and indoor air quality issues in say split system air conditioning considerations, right? In residential applications. We did a study in a, in a say a typical apartment. This is the bedroom. There's a bathroom here, which has an exhaust fan. And here is the, you know, the walkway or rather the, the entrance to the bedroom. Uh, and that's the door or access to the bathroom. So here's a split system unit. Uh, the point I will try to make here is split system unit does not give you any ventilation at all whatsoever. CO2 concentration level on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Uh, I mean, let me just talk briefly about what happened in the early part of the evening on the day of this measurement. Uh, for adults in the experimental phase, you know, that's where they were occupying and then you find the CO2 level was 2000 ppm. Then it gets dropped all the way down to 500 ppm, uh, 400 plus ppm. That is because when they leave, um, you, you actually uh, find that uh, the CO2 level eventually drops. When nobody is there, it'll drop. It'll come down to the occupant uh, level, I mean, to, to, to the ambient level. Why did this happen, the drop happened? Because the exhaust fan was on. When you turn off the exhaust fan off, uh, you find that you don't get much of an air change. Now, here is another case. In the nighttime, we said when two people occupied the room, two, and a, two adults and a child, CO2 gets built up up to a point, even as high as close to 3,000 ppm, 3,000 ppm. And at the time, the exhaust fan is off. You don't get much of an air change. 0 0.32 is not a big deal not much of an air change at all. When you turn the exhaust fan on, I'm sorry, when you turn the exhaust fan on, you find that the levels can, the CO2 level can drop very dramatically down to about 1000 ppm. Now in most standards, indoor air quality standards, you'll find 1000 ppm indicated as a, you know, typical recommended value for CO2, but we measure 3000, three times as high as that. Uh, it's a different discussion. We can have what that means in terms of the general air quality level in the space. Obviously, it cannot be very good when you measure high CO2 level. It is indicative of the fact that there isn't much of a dilution happening in the space. It gets dropped to this with simply an exhaust fan in operation in tandem with the split system air conditioning unit in, 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 uh, in operation at that point in time. So a simple pull or a volume of space has been uh, you know, able to result in very good dilution. Takeaway message, split system unit spaces do not give any, any adequate, adequate level of ventilation whatsoever. You don't even get 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you know, 0 0.3 was the best we were able to measure and that's not adequate. You need to have at least about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ACH in any space to have at least some level of ventilation. Otherwise, you just don't have any, any movement for dilution at all. Uh, okay, so let me move on. I'm almost towards the end of my presentation here. I would now like to talk about something that we have in our group, in our school, in our university. We are, we are very uh, you know, uh, uh, happy to talk about this building. It's the first new built, custom built net zero energy building, right? It's uh, called SDE4. This was uh, completed in late 2018 and launched on the 30th of January, as you can see from this uh, news clip. It was uh, inaugurated and it's been in operation for a couple of years now. Admitted last year, uh, you know, because of COVID-19 measures, uh, occupancy had been a little bit on the lower side, but Nevertheless, what's the concept? We have, 
we have different uh, design concepts in terms of the air conditioning and air distribution. We have something called a hybrid air conditioning concept where the temperatures maintained in the space are warmer. 27 degrees is what we are maintaining here. Humidity, whatever it results in, which is typically about 60% or slightly lower than that, that's what we get. 27 degrees may not feel very comfortable, thermal comfort wise. We use fans, ceiling fans. So that's what is the design concept. Warmer temperature, and then we use ceiling fans to provide that local air movement. And it's been found to be very, very comfortable. People like it. I mean, I've had a PhD student who's done detailed studies on the design concept of this hybrid air conditioning. In fact, the air, the air supply to the space is based on dedicated outdoor air system concept, meaning we don't use any recirculation, a single pass system, but it's maintaining the space at the warmer temperature. The single pass means that we're using 100% outside air and we are almost providing two or three times more than what the minimum ventilation requirement is calling for, right? So the air quality is very good. And we find that in our studies, I, I will probably skip through or rather skim through that part of it very quickly. And that's what we are trying to see here in the slide. My student was able to do a detailed study on this uh, uh, space, in the studio space on uh, uh, in, in the building. And then uh, we find that when conventional concept. So the blue zone conventional being compared with the, the DOAS uh, and the ceiling fan augmented design concept uh, as the in, in the red zones. Some of the numbers here, we just tells you what is the airflow and all that kind of stuff. I want to just go straight to um, um, the data that we collected from here, just to give you a sense of where we are and how we are, how we are experiencing it. Uh, bear in mind that uh, we had students and other users of the building, 235 subjects uh, with that split of male and female uh, distribution. I mentioned this to you. Look at all these measurements in S1 to S4 zones, which is really where the hybrid system is being supplied uh, with the supply air. Um, we do measure 27 degrees, as you can see here. And the other space computer lab was 24. That's what it was designed for. And we, we, whatever I said earlier, that's what I'm showing here on this slide. Uh, Dr. Kuniyaki Mihara now, he is, was my former PhD student and it was part of the work that he did for his PhD. Uh, this one slide talks about the different, uh, you know, details of thermal comfort and uh, basic thermal comfort details. Thermal sensation values on a scale of seven from hot to cold. Look at conventional system over here, 34 degrees, this is 27 degrees. Look at that neutral perception, you know, people do like it. It's, it's not a, a, a major concern for them. Hardly anyone ever perceived it to be hot. Some of them maybe want it to be warm, even 24 degrees are perceived to be warm in that sense. Uh, so here is the DOAS ceiling fan, dedicated outdoor air system combined with ceiling fan here, and that's the FFE, FCU. And uh, we find that uh, the thermal sensation was uh, not really very different in terms of uh, the warmer temperature. Um, the median value that is, you can look at it zero here, and this is minus one. So the, the 24 degree environment was perceived to be slightly cool, but the DOA CF, you know, it, it was neutral. And likewise, the thermal preference, when you try to understand what this slide shows you, uh, it was statistically significant. With the DOA CF system, you find a lot more people uh, who find it to be, uh, who did not want a change. Thermal preference did not want a change. Thermal comfort too, statistically significant. Thermal acceptability as well. So I'm, I'm kind of moving through this part a little bit uh, quickly because I'm, I think my time is running out. I would like to leave some time for the Q&A as well. So this is the air movement preference. Uh, between the DOA CF and the FCU, we find that um, 
you know, about 54 plus 25 percent here, uh, they, you know, people actually find uh, they don't need to have any more change um, when we're talking about the air movement preference. And likewise, the air movement acceptability as well. Uh, this is the indoor air quality acceptability and, and the dry comfort acceptability. Um, you find that uh, between, say, even the DOA CF and the FCU, some of these things turns out to be slightly better uh, when it comes to the DOA CF system. Uh, I, I will leave that in terms of the specific data, just two or three more slides and I wrap up. This building, uh, as I said, has received several accolades. I won't go into details of it. It is, um, uh, you know, our first building um, to have received the well-certified gold standard and the first building in Singapore to achieve this prestigious uh, well certification. Uh, let me move on further. So what's the future of indoor air quality in the built environment? We have buildings of different types, commercial buildings, recreational buildings, office buildings, historical buildings, residential buildings, you name it, all kinds of buildings. If the last year has taught us anything, it's just you know, given us this reality that we will be spending even more time in indoor environments, built environments. Our, our nature of built environment may change from office to home, but it still is an indoor environment. What are important? It is important that we look at the buildings and its interaction with the communities that we become part of, and then the cities that is a larger part of what we belong to. Uh, we need to look at how buildings can be made more sustainable. We need to look at how buildings will provide the good indoor air quality uh, and the energy consumption that goes with it. And the air quality has become even more significant in times of this COVID that we have all been experiencing the last uh, 15 months plus. And it's not going to go away in terms of the emphasis. So we are not talking about indoor air quality just for the purpose of feeling you know, fresh and good from a comfort perspective. There is also this important requirement of ensuring the air is safe. The air is, you know, it can, the air distribution can help mitigate the transmission of infectious aerosols. So this has become like a new, you know, uh, requirement, new paradigm shift. And recently there, uh, you must have heard about this article that was published in Science on the 13th of May, a group of, 39 scientists uh, happen to be one of the co-authors in that article. So we are actually calling for a paradigm shift in ventilation requirements or in ventilation design. It is the fundamental requirement in any space. Has been for 100 over years. The ventilation standards are not new. It's just that the way they have been presented, the way they have been implemented, we now need to look at it a little bit more uh, clear way, we probably have to be more aware of it and ensure that at no point in time in the operation of the building, ventilation can be compromised in any way. That's what the SARS-CoV-2 has taught us in the last year and a half. Sustainability becomes important consideration with a lot of data that we can collect. We are able to, I'm sure we can make that link between indoor air quality, clean and good air from all perspectives, comfort and you know, protection of uh, people from the perspective of mitigating the transmission of any infectious aerosol. It could be something else in the future. When you have outside air that is bad, polluted, you would need to do something about how to clean it and bring it into the space. So what I'm showing you on this slide is the importance of air quality importance of the environmental considerations indoor that will play an even more significant role in how we manage our buildings. So the IAQ audit, the system zone, that doesn't go away, but it is now placed with this emphasis. Let's not forget the indoor air quality and its importance. So in final slide, I just mentioned that, I shared with you the idea of the system zone concept.
when it comes to indoor air quality audit. I shared with you several case studies looking at the indoor air quality parameters measured, ventilation parameters, human response, and the like. And just articulating this vision of the future indoor air quality in the built environment, where we, we are going to be looking at things that become more critical, things that become more important, ventilation, comfort, temperature requirements, the need to combine all of that in a way that things can be done in a more sustainable manner. Data is going to play a very big role, tons of data that we can collect. How do you make use of all of that in ensuring the objectives of a healthy and sustainable built environment for all? Thank you for your attention. With that, I will I'll end my talk and I will pass the screen to uh, Professor Shiva and ask him to see how you may want to do this. Thank you so much. Yeah, Mr. Chandrasekhar, thank you for a wonderful lecture. It was, uh, you know, enlighten us, uh, uh, particularly in the current times, looking at uh, the indoor air quality, particularly the ventilation aspect. Uh, thank you so much for the, this lecture. My pleasure. Before, uh, you know, taking up, because there are some couple of questions already, I know there are many questions will come. Uh, uh, so we'll check quickly, uh, uh, take one uh, uh, photo of all the people just to start your camera so that we'll, you'll also get some one, one or two minutes break so that we can start discussing about the questions. So all of you just uh, you know, turn your camera on so that we will have a, a picture for the lecture. So Gopika, can you, uh, can you initiate yes. uh, once everybody is there, then uh, you can say. Everybody's on. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Finish? you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Chandrasekhar, could you please, uh, uh, possible for you to read the question from the chat box uh, or should we uh, display that one? Um, okay. Just click on the chart. Maybe uh, our... Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure if you want all the questions. No, 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 no. How much no, time no, we have? Maybe you can, you can pick up uh, which are you feel uh, maybe uh, in relevance of the current... Uh, uh, Okay. Uh, you say maybe Fair you can a few of them. Yes. Fair enough. I will. I will start just scrolling through from the top to see how it uh, how it has appeared. Um, okay. Uh, sorry. Now, how's uh, use of AC? One can be sure at this Corona era, the air quality is okay, pure and oxygenated without virus. Is there any measure to check the same? Um, well, I think. Uh, I think it's a bit difficult for me to talk about the oxygenated part without the virus. What we can ensure is uh, whether there's enough ventilation being provided. Uh, in fact, I just uh, saw that the Indian uh, government, I think it's your, it's your Ministry of Health, I'm not sure which ministry it is, has come up with some very nice visual graphics about how to ventilate. Uh, it's a 13 page document. Uh, I, I, I was directed to that by one of my colleagues from Europe. Uh, I think it says very, very simply, you know, simple house where you only have uh, one way in which the air can enter. That means there is no cross ventilation. In the, at the minimum, you can open up the other side window to ensure some cross ventilation. Or you can ensure that there is air movement within the space to have Generally, we talk about the push and pull concept. So if you can keep that in mind as general uh, thoughts, uh, it is possible to, to see how ventilation can help. Um, in this pandemic situation, especially during the second wave of COVID-19, CD scanning recommendation is more to assess severity. There are reports indicating the spread of infection through the indoor air or CT console. CT machine, what machine we taken to do indoor sanitation in short period of time. 
So the question I would interpret this as uh, maybe the question is specifically relating to healthcare setting. Um, generally, I think if we can ventilate, ventilate. If we, you know, have done the best to ventilate, and then you still need to ensure local cleaning. There are strategies. There are uh, air filtration, you know, technologies using HEPA filters and maybe ultraviolet disinfection strategy. These are all being, uh, again, uh, proposed and talked about in different circles. Uh, I know in ASHRAE, ASHRAE is the American you know, Society of Heating, Refrigerating, Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, it's an international, uh, it has an international outreach. Um, again, I saw another document that has been produced by ISHRAE in India. Uh, ISHRAE and ASHRAE have a lot of uh, collaborative uh, par partnerships too and, and collaborative activities. In their document, uh, there is a clear, again, guidance provided specific to ventilation and uh, cleaning or rather the, the local cleaning aspect of it. So I'll probably say in that sense, there is recommendation and guidance that is provided for ensuring that you don't end up having accumulation of what might be considered as potentially contaminated air. That means a lot of infectious air that stays in one space. You don't want that to happen. Um, we don't have any IAQ standards. Well, um, I think there is an indoor air quality standard. This is from uh, ISHRE, if I'm not mistaken, ISHRE standard. I, I can find the reference and send to uh, Professor Shiva. Um, do you also mean air tightness of the rooms? Yes, uh, air tightness is part of what I was referring to. When we measure ventilation characteristics, like using tracer gas measurements, it is actually uh, incorporating or including the air tightness. The tighter the room, the more uh, challenging it becomes for ventilation air to come in unless it is designed and distributed properly as a mechanically ventilated uh, space. For measuring ACH, do we need a control environment? It's so hard to maintain it in real room. Uh, no, we don't need to do that in a con as a control environment. In fact, the whole idea is in in situ buildings, you want to measure the ACH in as existing setup. So if you have a building that is not so airtight, going back to the previous question, and you do a measurement, you will get an ACH that is, you know, a combination of how much is the air coming by your mechanical ventilation system and how much is being added by your air leakiness. So it is ventilation and infiltration that we are actually measuring when we do a tracer gas measurements in in situ buildings. So I would, I would say that you don't need a control environment. You should measure it actual environment, actual setting as the building is. Is bioaerosols playing a key role in IAQ and how long it could be viable in air? Well, I, I, I'm interpreting this question as uh, the concern of infectious aerosols. Again, it's another topic I talk about in terms of the transmission of aerosols and how we can look at it. Very simply, you know, when you have an infectious source, uh, infected person in the building as an infectious source, whatever comes out as exhaled air through any vocalization activity, singing, talking, breathing, coughing, sneezing, whatever, some of them, it's a continuum of particles that come out. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus is embedded within uh, the droplets that are formed as we speak out in the saliva particles and so on. So the size particles is anywhere from one, two, three microns all the way up to 100 microns. It can be that. It's a continuum and then it moves through. If you are coughing, it moves through a long distance. If you're just talking, it is still moving through the heavier particles will fall down, that's the droplets, the smaller size particles, the lighter size, the lighter particles will move with the airstream. It will remain suspended in the air. It does not have to be five micron size and below. That used to be the whole, the, the old uh, criteria used by WHO. I mean, I'm sure you would have seen the latest advisory, the changes that happened on WHO website, USCDC, and a lot of countries have uh, changed, including the one from uh, the Indian Ministry advice that I was referring to. So we are now saying that if you have a 30 micron particle that came out 
in the exhale there, if you have a 50 micron sized particle in which let's say there's potentially the virus that is embedded, given the right airflow, it can move beyond two meter distance. It can move up to eight, you know, three meters, four meters. In the context of a room, within the room scale, you can have this movement. So the infectious aerosols in that sense, let's say we are out of this COVID situation in a normal situation, we would still want to ensure that there is reasonable level of protection. That's why ventilation becomes important. That's why uh, not allowing the buildup of you know, contaminated air is very critical. And I'm sure moving forward, designs will incorporate some of this thinking. How we do that, it, it remains to be seen. There are some thought processes that I'm also involved in, say in ASHRAE, in the discussions. Do we need to have this as a continuous setup all the time? Maybe you can think in terms of a normal mode of operation and a pandemic mode of operation. So many different ways in which you can think about it. So next question here, that was a very long answer to a simple question. It was talking about bioaerosol. I thought it would be useful to mention that. With your explanation, it appears there is little role to play by false ceiling. In some cases, false ceiling is found to be problematic. What would you explain? Okay, the false ceiling that we find in a lot of buildings, um, the whole idea is it's an architectural enhancement. It gives you a different perspective in the space. And usually what happens is the space above is used for all the services. You have your, your electrical lines, your communication lines, including your air distribution, ductwork, and things like that. Most importantly, if you have an air distribution system or other air-based uh, concept of air conditioning and air distribution, the return air goes through the ceiling plenum. You know, it's simple, easy. That's the reason why a lot of places you go a false ceiling. The, the problematic part comes in if the space above is not maintained well. Out of sight, out of mind. We know that because nobody generally looks at things above the air, above the false ceiling, uh, it can potentially be of some concern from an indoor air quality perspective. For improved perfect displacement flow, building orientation can play a significant role. Absolutely, I fully agree with you. If you have a facade with a lot of uh, glazing and you're gonna have radiant heat come in and if you have displacement ventilation, it's gonna cause a problem. There, there will be implications, not just displacement ventilation, even underflow air distribution. You can have an impact of radiant heat on, on the indoor airflow distribution. Um, with your explanation, it appears there is, okay, I've already done that. For improved perfect displacement flow building, what, yeah, we've done that. The question is being repeated again. Could you please throw a light on standards for indoor air quality healthcare facility? There is an ASHRAE standard 170, 170. It's ventilation for healthcare facilities. If you visit the ASHRAE website and if you go to the COVID-19 preparedness resource page, uh, you should be able to lead to this particular link uh, where the standards are now being made available for free to read online. You see, as part of uh, uh, you know, the community service, a lot of these uh, professional bodies are making it possible for relevant uh, ventilation and health-related standards to be freely available. Otherwise, one needs to purchase this. So again, uh, I, I can send the link to Shiva and then he can, with the Shiva, and then he can uh, follow, for forward it to the participants regarding that. Considering Indian uh, residential buildings, what is your opinion about implementation of IAQ and the regulatory framework? Well, uh, one of the challenges with the regulatory framework for indoor air quality has been the difficulty in implementation, right? That's been the biggest, we have standards. In Singapore, we have standards, actually standards exist. Uh, these standards need to be incorporated into a building regulation or building regulatory framework. Uh, there are some countries that have tried to do that. South Korea is one of uh, that. I believe Taiwan also has that. Um, there are challenges, not so straightforward to implement it, but that's really what we are calling for in the science article. If you, if you get to read that, we are basically saying that ventilation standards need to be enhanced and need to be ensured that it fulfills the minimum requirement. I mean, it has to be mandated 
Ventilation standards are probably mandated in most countries in one way or the other. Even, even let's say, you know, if you say you need to provide a minimum, uh, say five liters per second per person of outside air or eight liters per second per person outside air for office environment, that is almost like the basic design norm and you have to ensure it, it comes there. Okay, your views on re retrofitting existing HVAC systems with air quality control systems. How to keep energy requirement minimum or without changing the fan? Uh, well, the two, two questions are quite uh, different in a way. Retrofitting existing system with air quality control, not totally impossible or not even that difficult. Um, I would even think about maybe having a CO2 sensor or maybe even a distributed set of CO2 sensors, collect the data in real time, maybe have some way of aggregating it and link it to maybe the, the outside air damper uh, if it exists in the system for ventilation. Um, so there are, there are ways in which it can be done, but not everything can be easily retrofitted. Some of this will require an additional level of technical detailing and, uh, and installation of certain sensors, actuators in the, in the space. Uh, so I think I've reached the end of the question, Shiva. Sure. I'm yes, sorry, sir. I just went in one whole sketch. Uh, <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. It's a, it's a pleasure. I think. Thank you very much for your uh, time. Probably, I just wanted to, uh, you know, ask you one more thing. Like, you know, when people are get infected, when they, uh, you know, respire, will the particle size distribution? I'm just trying to look at it. If somebody breathes, uh, will some studies have been made in that directions to understand? Uh, probably, when uh, when the microbes are attaching to that, probably the size distribution could vary. Uh, depending on the kind of infection, probably is there any such studies has been made uh, that may helpful to uh, even uh, try to figure out that uh, how how far this kind of and I am not talking about only today, but uh, in the future also maybe we need to look at it a little more close. I mean we may go going to get this kind of a challenge uh, in yeah. the near future also. So so to answer your question, yes, there are some studies uh, in not with SARS-CoV-2. But with other, uh, say, uh, uh, common common cold situation, right? Uh, in the past, other other viruses, um, these have been done in setups where you have a closed loop system, and then uh, people have used, say, uh, cough droplet. I mean, uh, coughing machine, right? Uh, simulated cough uh, uh, droplets. People have used tracer gas. Uh, uh, we have done some studies of local extraction in the occupied space. Uh, again, I have another presentation on that. I think uh, I may have spoken about that in one of the earlier talks. So there are different ways in which that have been done. With SARS-CoV-2, there are research uh, projects underway in different groups. Even in our own group, my colleague is leading one where we, uh, where we were trying to actually uh, see if we can, you know, uh, get the actual data of the size distribution of a person who is uh, uh, known to be even asymptomatic and then, or maybe even uh, uh, pre-symptomatic. That means you know that this person has some uh, issues or maybe his, uh, uh, you know, uh, CT value is, uh, is, is kind of low enough to say that, yes, he could be a carrier, C positive that is. And then try to see if we can get some information about the, the distribution based on different types of activities, simple exhalation, talking like let's say I'm doing now, or talking loudly, singing. And uh, you know, then you have issues like if they sneeze, what happened? If they, if they cough, what happens? So we have, a, th there is a special kind of a gadget, a setup, if you like, into which they speak is like a cone and then over there, the droplets go down. Um, it, it's, it's a very specialized setup um, where we got something along those lines being in, uh, in, done in collaboration with uh, our collaborator from University of Maryland. Uh, it's called the Gesundai G2 machine. Uh, but uh, specifically with relate, in relation to SARS-CoV-2, such data are not yet available. Uh, I might be wrong if I look into literature hard enough, maybe there is some data uh, available in terms of people doing distribution in the, 
say, in field studies, where they may have measured, assuming that a person is in, an, in, in a particular location, uh, some distance away, half a meter away, one meter away, two meters away. But that's the kind of information that would be very useful and important. Um, my understanding is um, the SARS-CoV-2, in terms of what happens at the immediate exhaled left point, um, is, is probably not too different from some of the earlier uh, studies published in the literature. But we, we, need, we need to have this confirmation, whether it is exactly the same or basically you're going to have a size distribution of some kind. And that size distribution can vary from very close to the, you know, the person, the source, and then as it moves away. What we know is it is not a case of particles up to this size exist here, particles beyond that size go somewhere else. It is a continuum. If you take a cross section at any location, you're going to find particles of different sizes. So that profile will change, but it will not be that up to this micron you'll only find here and not elsewhere. Especially with the airborne transmission drought being possible, the, you know, the five micron and less definitely will be airborne for a much longer distance. Even the 20 microns, 30 microns can go even longer with the air current. Let's say we, we, we turn on a fan to enhance the mixing. So you may dilute the strength or the, you know, the, the, what we call the intensity of that uh, uh, particles in near the source, but it will get distributed elsewhere. So the ideal thing for this will, at least in, in my opinion still is, if I can extract it at source, maybe clean it and put it back into the room or take it out of the room and throw it out after filtration or whatever, that might still, that may still be the more preferred approach. But all this requires more detailed engineering controls. It's not just a simple way of one can do this everywhere. The simple thing is the room already has an air distribution system. Like the question being asked earlier, if you turn the fan on, it's going to spread everywhere. Then if there is good ventilation, dilution, the room air needs to be exhausted. So that's really the point. The air cannot continue staying in the room and you keep mixing it. That's not a, that's not a good strategy. Thanks, Professor Chandrasekhar. I think what, thank you very much for a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, now I request Dr. Madhusudan to say, propose a vote of thanks. And uh, your lecture will be available in our uh, SIPA website. And uh, those who are interested, they can uh, watch it again if, uh, if they missed it in some part of time. But yeah, it's available. And uh, we will also upload your uh, presentation as uh, once you, your PDF is available with you. Thank you. Dr. Matsu, then you unmute yourself. Yeah. Welcome back. We do understand that we are going through a very bad situation in the country, but uh, we could uh, see that we have uh, 85 plus participants for this uh, today's uh, lecture series. And uh, our subject was quite uh, relevant for this today's uh, situation that is the air quality audit in building system, the own concept. And uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, he explained the entire concept in a systematic way. And uh, maximum uh, time he has taken for explaining the question answer. After uh, uh, listening the question answer, I can understand that uh, rather than a, an engineering uh, 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 question answer. It was the question answer from a doctor concept. So I definitely feel that uh, our uh, selection of the expert for this today's uh, eighth uh, uh, lecture series quite interesting and quite apt for the present situation. Professor has explained the concept of uh, indoor air quality with the exposure control approach, ventilation effectiveness, and the breathing zone. And he also explained the indoor air quality audit approach and how the audit has to be conducted with uh, what are the management plan required for it. And further, uh, he has uh, 
explained with the case studies and uh, and the last uh, the part of his uh, lecture was explaining about the customer build uh, net zero building concept so it was a great uh, pleasure to listen uh, professor chandrashekar sir and on thank behalf you. of sipa uh, network we thank uh, uh, professor for uh, um, giving the wonderful uh, lecture and uh, we also thank our uh, participants who they are from uh, different uh, institutions different uh, uh, from moef uh, moef cpcb my earlier colleagues i can see many of them are uh, here listening the uh, lecture series and also uh, the colleagues from uh, state pollution control board and uh, also the student community and the teachers community we thank everybody who attended to this uh, lecture series uh, we take this opportunity to announce that uh, the coming world environment day we have uh, uh, three programs the uh, community event which we already advertised for the uh, the schools in the country and uh, we have an invited talk and also we have a panel discussion uh, we will be sending all the uh, relevant links to all of you uh, and we request you to attend uh, and don't miss this uh, opportunity and we understand that uh, this pandemic time we can do only uh, through the virtual uh, uh, meetings and we thank the office team the sipa network team the uh, iiqm team and the envitron team for supporting the uh, iitm for conducting this uh, um, monthly lecture series the team includes uh, dr deeraj gopika and swaroop and we thank the other uh, uh, students supporting the team for conducting this uh, lecture series also we thank our mentor and the network director professor shivana gendra for the guidance and the coordination so uh, with his guidance we could complete uh, our assignments in time and uh, uh, we can bring the quality in every aspect of our sipa network uh, sipa network thank you once again for attending the uh, aqm lecture series and uh, we hope that uh, our aqm lecture series for nine will be in uh, in june third week of june thank you all yeah thanks sir, dr mansur then thanks for such energy shaker so thank you so much professor shiva nagendra and uh, uh, you know all the organizers of this series for inviting me it's always a pleasure to share uh, what 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 we what what i have uh, found from my own observations it's good to have this knowledge being disseminated especially in today's context where we need to you know share our knowledge with everyone i learn a lot from all the questions uh, to be honest when i hear the questions in all the presentations that i make uh, that spur me to think uh, oh yeah okay maybe something more and something else can be done as well so it it is a nice exchange platform like the one that you have here so thank you again for inviting me and uh, um, it's my pleasure to have participated in this thank you thank you professor chandrashekar thank you all for uh, joining us uh, professor chandrashekar you may be knowing that there are many young uh, you know research uh, students are there and probably they will uh, you know nurture with uh, many of you like uh, the way the lectures will be you know make them to learn more and more and focus towards their research thank you very much and uh, thank you. see you all in the next event uh, uh, take care uh, stay, uh, stay safe uh, bye bye Yeah stay safe everyone bye